faith, your word has made us bold to seize the gift of love retold. All that you are, we hear, receive, and all we are to you, we give. Lord Jesus Christ, we humbly pray, O oh, keep us steadfast till that day, when each will be your welcomed guest in heaven's high and holy feast. Amen. I encourage you to open uh, your Bibles uh, to Luke chapter 14 uh, as we meditate on the text this day. Again, I will read it. Uh, <coughs> Give you a little chance. One Sabbath, when he went to dine at the house of a ruler of the Pharisees, they were watching him carefully. And behold, there was a man before him who had dropsy. And Jesus responded to the lawyers and Pharisees, saying, Is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath or not? But they remained silent. Then he took him and healed him and sent him away. And he said to them, Which of you having a son or an ox that has fallen into a well on a Sabbath day will not immediately pull him out? And they could not reply to these things. Now he told a parable to those who were invited, whom he noticed how they chose the places of honor, saying to them, When you are invited by someone to a wedding feast, do not sit down in a place of honor lest someone more distinguished than you be invited by him. And he who invited you both will come and say to you, give your place to this person, and then you will begin with shame to take the lowest place. But when you are invited, go and sit in the lowest place, so that when your host comes, he may say to you, friend, move up higher. Then you will be honored in the presence of all who sit at table with you. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. He said also to the man who had invited him, When you give a dinner or a banquet, do not invite your friends or your brothers or your relatives or rich neighbors, lest they also invite you in return and you be repaid. But when you give a feast, invite the poor, the crippled, the lame, the blind, and you will be blessed because they cannot repay you, for you will be repaid at the resurrection of the just. We're going to entertain a few questions today. Uh, and hopefully as we go through these questions, uh, it might contemplate maybe even some of your behaviors within the banqueting hall. Did you realize that we are in the banqueting hall today? Uh, because again, as, as we talk about Holy Communion, as we, as we receive the sacrament of the altar, we talk about that being a foretaste of the feast to come. So right now, we are in that foretaste of the feast to come, so we are getting that glimpse of sitting in the banqueting hall. And I've got the best seat in the house. <laughs> Sorry, folks. But first question I want you to entertain is, who is welcomed among you? Who is welcomed among you? And, and again, in order to welcome properly, and my wife does this far better than I do, and, and, I, I, and I know there is the spiritual gift of hospitality, and those people really do it well. But in order to do that, there's that sense of hospitality, that sense of humility, that person that's going to go the extra mile to make sure that you feel at home. No matter where you are, no matter whether you're in this banqueting hall, whether you're in the banqueting halls that are in downtown Blairsville, whether you are in the banqueting hall of somebody's home, that person who welcomes you has that sense of hospitality, has that sense of humility. And, and they are going to make very tangible efforts to make you feel at home. And, and in all the efforts that they do to prepare for you coming, but also as they greet you in coming, and also as, as you are there in their home, as they go through all those tangible efforts, they're hoping that there are going to be some typical results. And that is 
your happiness, but even more importantly, your joy. And what also occurs in that person, because it's their home, it's their place, it's their abode, it's where they are most comfortable, what they are trying to do is trade places. And it reminds me of a trip I took before I went to the seminary. I was flying down to Orlando for a workshop on uh, a, a Bible training, a Bible teaching series. And I happened to have two fellow pastors in the Atlanta area with me. One of them is now our current district president, Greg Walton. He was only a lowly pastor at that point. But I was only a lowly DCE at that point. But there was a Third, a uh, second pastor, a third person, Kempuri Manicha. Uh, Kempuri Manicha was here for my ordination. He's a Laotian pastor uh, down in South Atlanta. And his wife works for Delta. And so we went down for the conference down in Orlando. We were there for three, four days. Uh, and we were ready to come home that evening. And so we were gathered together waiting around, but he always had to fly standby. And so we got our seat assignments. So President Walton and I took our seats next to each other, and we left Campori at the gate. Well, if you've ever flown Delta, especially as you're getting close to the weekend, uh, it, it's sometimes hard to fly standby. And so, President Walton and I, we were in our seats. In fact, uh, it was such a full flight, we had to share a Diet Coke and share a bag of peanuts. <laughs> and so, we had a wonderful flight, wonderful discussion, but our, our thoughts and concerns were always with, uh, I wonder if Kempori made it, because we never saw him come on the, on the plane. And, oh, he's going to have to spend the night in Orlando. Well, as we disembark, President Walton and I are going forward, and then coming from the front, backward, is Campuri Manicha. <laughs> Campuri goes, oh, wasn't that a wonderful flight? Did you guys have chicken? <laughs> <laughs> no, we shared a bag of peanuts and a Diet Coke. Those who are exalted will be humbled. Those who are humbled will be exalted. That's what happens each time we gather together and worship. That's why they call what we do the divine service. Take, take a look at the, the liturgies in, in front of the hymnal. It's divine service one, divine service two. It's divine service because here we are coming to the banqueting hall, thinking we're the ones doing the service, but no, it's God who is serving us with his gifts. This is divine service. And, 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 and in the matter of it, no, our feet might not be washed, but boy, are we taken care of through his word and through his sacrifice. And so as we come here on a Sunday morning, part of our preparation might even be uh, the consideration of uh, what, what am I going to do as we gather to thank and praise the God who is serving us this day? Well, I know one thing I see in our church and one thing I see in every church sort of runs contrary to that. And it begins out there. Because, because as, as I see some of that behavior, as, as we come together to thank and to praise God, what, what I see even starting out there is, hey, can I, can I get the closest parking space? And, and, and then as we, as we pull in a little closer, as we get in, into the North X, we, we begin seeing holy huddles clustered together. And, and, and as they cluster together, there's this sort of cloistered talk. This, this cloistered talk among them in their, in their little groups. 
And yeah, you, you would think we were back in the, uh, the turn of the century uh, where, where settlers came in to claim their spot to, to mine their gold as people also come in to claim their pew. In fact, I just read not too long ago that there, there, there was a Baptist church that this pastor was at where he, he thought it was odd that there were these pillows all over the sanctuary. What people had done is they had made a pillow, embroidered it to save their spot for Sunday morning. <laughs> and it sort of, it sort of runs off the, off the mindset of last, last Sunday's gospel text where, where the people said, y you know, we ate and drank with you. You taught in our streets. That should count for something. But it's not only about who is welcome among us. And I think our text takes it to that next step today is how are they welcomed? How do you welcome those who are coming into our midst? I know there are certain social structures that sort of maintain how we do that, especially as you see it happening in homes. But I think there's also some biblical structure on how we do that. But the thing is, we, we, we not only look to the biblical structure of how we welcome people in, but we, we like to put our distinctives upon it. We, we, we like to frame it in a certain way. What we want to do is we, we want to count on our position in the church as as those people in, in the last chapter in, in 13 said, hey, we're here regularly. We, we want to sort of count on our position that we, we can, you know, that's got to be good for something. And, and so we begin to calculate what privileges we deserve. We, we begin to calculate what preferred treatment we desire. We, we calculate how we're looked upon by the others that are surrounding us, especially pastors. Hey, the fuller your pews are, the higher up you are. And, 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 and as, as we calculate that, uh, that view of, of just how we look, we, we want to take that moment to claim our spot, to claim our place. And, 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 and instead, of, instead of a church being a mutual secret society, which some people think we are, <laughs> but if children, teenagers, or guests come in, they can tell you differently. There's nothing too secret about what we do. It only seems to be about the people who are here regularly that sort of lose sight. No, we're not a mutual secret society. We're a mutual seated society. Because we gather our identity by who we're dining with. We gather our identity by who we're seated next to. Because we like what is comfortable and familiar. And sometimes we as a church become a well-worn shoe. But there's one problem with a well-worn shoe. It doesn't hold up very well in the storm. <coughs> no, instead, this is, this is where we have developed a, a mentality 
And, and, and I had to Google the phrase. I love computers. You Google things, you're close to it, it pops up. And, and, I, and I do ask you to raise your hand if you've heard this before. A man is known by the company he keeps. Heard that? A man is known by the company he keeps. And if you're not careful, you can misthink that in regards to this scripture because, oh, then I need to sit with the wealthy, I need to sit with the accomplished, I need to sit with the ones who look good in the favor of people, I need to sit with the ones who have a political identity with me. A man is known by the company he keeps. And the truth is for you and for me, in Jesus, the tables have been turned. Because in Jesus, as we hear in Philippians 2, he emptied himself and took on the human form. He did not, he did not grasp onto his godness which he could have done. No. He emptied himself and took on the human form. And it didn't stop there. He humbled himself and took on the form of a servant. Really, that word doulos can be translated. He took on the form of a slave. The one who humbles himself. And so as we see in the story and as we see throughout the gospel, here Jesus, who humbles himself, sits and eats with the blind and the lame. Here Jesus sits and eats with the prostitute and the tax collector. Here, especially in this story, Jesus sits and eats with the Pharisees and the scribes. And today, Jesus sits and eats with you and me. But even more, Jesus suffered and died for the blind and the lame. Jesus suffered and died for the prostitute and the tax collector. Jesus suffered and died for the Pharisee and the scribe. And Jesus died for you and me. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Jesus suffered and died for you and for me. And so our value is because of whose we are, not by what you can do. It, it, it's not a matter of your credentials. It's not a matter of your accomplishments. It's not about a, a matter of your finances. It's not about a matter of how you look in other people's eyes. Your value is because of whose you are, because of what our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ did for us on the cross. And not by what we can do. Because the reality of it is, we can never repay Jesus for what he has done for us. But as he tells us in this text, and especially as he tells us in Hebrews, what we can do, what we can do is about being in relationship with him. And being in relationship with with others. Very interesting, this Hebrews 13 text, and you don't catch it here, but let me read it to you. I'm not going to read the whole thing. Let brotherly love continue. Do not neglect to show hospitality to strangers, for thereby some have entertained angels unawares. <clears throat> through him, through Jesus, then let us continually offer up a sacrifice of praise to God that is the fruit of lips that acknowledge his name. Do not neglect to do good and to share what you have, for such sacrifices are pleasing to God. 
13.1 and 13.2 really set the tone for us throughout this whole rest of the chapter of Hebrews 13. Because the first one says, let brotherly love continue. Philadelphia. Some of you might have visited Philadelphia. But that word Philadelphia means loving your brother. Loving your fellow believer. Loving those that you gather at the banqueting table with. And there are sometimes we don't do a very good job of that. Myself included. But he, he challenges us here because of what Jesus Christ has done for us. Let brotherly love continue. But then the next one is, do not neglect to show hospitality to strangers. The word there is philosenia. It means love the stranger. So not only love your brother who you know and who you are acquainted with, but love the stranger, the one that you have no idea. And oh yeah, they might look a little strange, they might sound a little strange, and they might even smell a little strange. But he says, love the stranger. Radical hospitality. Thereby, my request this morning. Because in radical hospitality, it means to reach out to someone different. And yeah, you're looking at somebody who can be different at times. So reach out to someone different. And this is the tough one. Give up your seat so that you can sit next to somebody that you're not as familiar with and maybe they're not familiar in our presence. <coughs> Do that on a Sunday morning and boy, you will shake the rafters. Also, Pay attention, pay attention to someone who, who's, not, who, who is not regularly noticed. Whether they're as they are coming into the doors, and sometimes that can be a little too much. Sometimes it might just be as they're sitting in the pews and, and you go, oh, I don't notice that face. Don't be worried if, if they're a member here or not. If you don't know them, Go talk to them. Hebrews 13.2 has played an interesting part of my life and, and is beginning to gravitate and play a very important part in the life of our congregation. Out in the fellowship hall, you will see a board with all the announcements. Um... I, I've mentioned this several times, uh, three or four, now I'm going to mention it again. We, are, we have begun to do a ministry in Blue Ridge at Grumpy Old Men Brewery. Yes, we Lutherans, we know something about that Lutheran beverage. But we've been doing a ministry at, at, at Grumpy Old Men Brewery. We have been sitting and, and sometimes we're... Many times we're sitting together, but sometimes we're off conversing with some of the other people that we've developed a relationship with. Hebrews 13.2 is very enlightening into that because we may be entertaining angels unawares. Oh, by the way, you'll see the logo that we are creating to have t-shirts as we minister to that. It says, he brews. The, the, letter, the letter B is the number 13. The S at the end is the number 2. Now, whether, whether you join us and participate with us in that ministry, or whether you come... Uh, a, a week from, two weeks from yesterday out at, at Meeks Park. Those are some great opportunities that we have to fulfill this gospel. Yes, continue to love your brother. But also, show hospitality to the stranger. Because you may be entertaining angels. <laughs> 